Good morning. Aloha. My name is Mark Shklov. I am the host of Law Across the Sea. Uh, and we have the luck today to have a great guest from the University of Hawaii School of Law. Uh, professor Maxine Burkett is a professor of law at the William S. Richardson School of Law at the University of Hawaii and is also currently a public policy fellow at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. Now, I don't know what that is, but maybe we'll find out. Uh, Professor Burkett attended Williams College, Exeter College, Oxford University, and received her law degree from Bolt Hall School of Law at the University of California in Berkeley. And we're very lucky to have her. Uh, Professor Burkett is an expert in the law and policy of climate change. And when I first talked with Professor Burkett, I asked her uh, what she'd like to talk about. And uh, she was right off the bat said, uh, climate induced migration, which was a new topic to me. And so welcome. Uh, thank, thank you for you. being here. May I call you Maxine? Of course. And thank you for having me on the show. Well, <laughs> my pleasure. Uh, and. Uh, you know, I didn't quote all of your resume. There's just too much uh, to, 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 to put on the air. We, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't ever be over. Uh, but, uh, you know, climate-induced migration, I, I didn't really know what that is, and I'm not sure I, I do now. Uh, but as I was going through some of articles and trying to get a little bit of a grasp of it, I kind of was reminded of an old Bobby Dylan tune, The, the Times They Are a-Changin'. And uh, that, that was about social change, and, but I, a lot of the wording uh, is very s similar. You better start swimming or you'll sink like a stone. And th that kind of reminded me as I was going through some of the articles. But, but tell me, what is climate-induced migration? Uh, give me an, a simple answer for me, please. Sure. Climate-induced migration describes the circumstances in which some kind of climate-related events forces movement of peoples. It's, a, it's the migration that happens as a result of some acute or long-term event. So a particular storm that we can somehow link to climate change uh, or a, a sort of a longer, slower onset disaster like drought, desertification, flooding, those events can induce people to, to move from where they're currently living. Okay, now is climate-induced migration related to uh, global warming or the, 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 the sea rise or, or these type of right. things that I, I've heard more about? Sure. Uh, what, what's the relationship? And is it, you know, you mentioned sort of long-term and short-term type, type things. That's right. So, so what's the difference? What are we, is it all related or is it different? That's, that's a great question, which is why sort of the simple answer as to, you know, what is climate-induced migration is difficult, but for good reason. I mean, these things are, are kind of complicated. Even the quotation that you read has dual meaning. There is sort of a, a stress in understanding, you know, we have to start swimming, right, in some, in some respects, but there's also a story of resilience there. And so, in short, we're looking at circumstances where climate change introduces a new kind of of uh, environment to a number of places. Uh, people have moved over millennia, that's what humans do, and they move for various reasons. But we're starting to see that climate change impacts are having specific influence on the decision to move. And uh, you asked about time scale, sometimes that's very short and quick. You know a storm is coming, a uh, super typhoon has, has passed by, uh, you're displaced. It could be a temporary displacement. It's a very specific event that's induced that. Um, and you may be able to return, you may not. That was the case uh, in other storm events, which may or may not have been linked to climate change, but again, if you think about Katrina, there are instances in which you're forced to move in the moment, some are able to return, some are not. But that displacement itself, to the extent that we know these storms are going to be more intense and with climate change, is part of what we understand to be climate-impacted decisions to move. Okay, so yeah. can you give me kind of an example I mean, the, what is like uh, something that's related, or, or, or do we know what's related to global right. warming or not? I mean, is it, is, it, is it just too hard to know what is related to what's called global warming and what, what's that? Right. I mean, that, that? That's another show. Yeah. But, but, <laughs> but what, 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 what are at least the theories of what's a long-term uh, 
right. example. Sure. Well, so when we see, when we're talking about climate change or global warming, there you can sort of use the terms interchangeably to some degree. But what you're talking about is the fact that our sort of industrialized societies have influenced the atmospheric chemistry, right? And what that means is that the more carbon we put into the atmosphere has created a greenhouse effect. We're seeing rising temperatures. And with those rising temperatures, we're also seeing uh, specific events affected by the change in sort of uh, the, the temperature rise, the increased energy in our atmosphere. And so you'll see everything from these more um, sort of intense uh, and, and longer storms that we, we're experiencing in terms of the sort of these major cyclones and superstorms. Um, and we'll also see longer term events that are happening. And these are the droughts, the increasing heat. Uh, these are the kinds of sea level rise um, data that we're seeing coming out and that we're observing now. And so both those slower events, um, ocean acidification is one as well, where we see the higher uh, higher acidity of our oceans, these are longer term events that are having impact on people's ability to live in the places that they currently do live. Uh, and then there are acute events like those storms, uh, like the coastal flooding that can happen during major events. Okay, so do you link it all together or is, it, is, there, some, is there a difference between what is caused by nature just in, in the millions of right. years that we have had nature sure. and man, man's influence right. into that area? Great question, especially in a situation like this, because one's decision to move has many causes. Uh, I'm an immigrant to this country. We came from Jamaica. The, no, the reasons why we left Jamaica are uh, many. Um, some were curiosity, some were opportunity. Uh, people make decisions in the given circumstance. And so migration is always inherently multi-causal. There are some circumstances, though, in which you know, you're completely unable to grow your crops in a particular particular area, and that triggers a number of decisions that follow on. The severity of the environmental background, if you will, will sometimes uh, encourage movement, sometimes rapidly because the storm is coming or has come and destroyed the space that you're in, or um, more slowly. What we're seeing right now, for example, in the Pacific Islands is a sea level rise that, uh, uh, that has multiple causes, but uh, the climate change is becoming a stronger signal, if you will, in terms of the impact of the ability to grow food, to get fresh water, um, uh, the ability to uh, have a coastal um, livelihood and, and development along the coastline that's not being inundated or impacted on a, on a more frequent basis. Those are the kind of triggers for movement that are joining in with other sort of human decision making that happens. It's also true, if I, if I could add, that um, Every society, com coastal community makes decisions about what happens on their coastlines. Some are wiser than others, and some will cause you to be more vulnerable to those impacts. So when you talk about sort of human inputs, it could be certainly on the front end in terms of how we're impacting our environment and the climate itself, but also in the decision making that we engage in over time that makes us more vulnerable to sort of to coastal flooding, for example, because we've decided to build a lot on the coastlines. We haven't made smart decisions about how we're going to uh, armor ourselves if there's natural armors or, or man-made armors, all of these things will complicate how vulnerable we are. Okay, so, uh, boy, that, yeah. that, that's a, a lot, a lot sure. of things to think and talk about. You know, you, you brought up the Pacific Islands. Yeah. Could you give me some specific examples of Pacific Islands that are being impacted? And I, I, I gather that we're talking about sea rise. Yes. And this sounds like climate change to me yes. uh, as, as a uh, person that doesn't know a lot about climate change, but it sounds like being caused by climate change. Uh, and so we have uh, man doing that and, and causing the, the, maybe the polar ice cap to melt and water to, to rise. Is that, is that? Yeah, there are a few dynamics there. And, I, and uh, you know, I, this is a show about law primarily, so I'll do my part in terms of sort of sharing the, the science of it, because it is important to understand what's causing all of this. What we're seeing in the Pacific is a combination of uh, sort of the climate variability that happens over time. So for example, you know, we're in an El Nino year, right? So El Ninos happen. Uh, it's just that they're happening on top of the sort of larger climate change that we're seeing, which is this mm -hmm. increasing trend. And so what we're seeing in the Pacific is sea level rise that is at this point more about thermal expansion. Water gets bigger and takes up more space with greater heat. And where? where the Pacific. We? We're talking about the Pacific now. We're talking about yeah. the Western Pacific. We're seeing a couple dynamics happening, but certainly sea level rise 
at this point globally is what we're seeing uh, is, is, is about glacier melt. It's also about the fact that the, 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 there's the, what's called thermal expansion in which we see water, the oceans are warming such that it's causing a rise in sea level. Okay. So that is, is actually not good news in the sense that once we start really seeing the inputs of the glacial melt, uh, we're talking about even more uh, impacts in terms of higher sea levels. In the Pacific, we have a number of examples of, of displacement. Uh, there is the internal displacement of the Carteret Islanders in, the, in Papua New Guinea. Okay. Carteret Islanders, okay. yeah. And what we see in that case is that, that uh, an atoll community uh, has had their atoll pretty much carved in half by the rise in sea level, and, and the people of the Carteret Islands are then uh, forced to find a new place to, to relocate. And for them, they have identified Luganville, which is part of Papua New Guinea, and we see that kind of internal relocation occurring. Um, and so it's, it's under, they are understood to be the first example of climate refugees um, because of that sea level rise impact that's more clearly linked to our burning fossil fuels, heightened temperatures, greater sea level rise. Uh, that's the move that's happening. Same in the Solomon Islands, we're seeing uh, the Chosul Township, the first municipality to have uh, to so coordinate a, uh, a, the movement of the entire municipality as a result of compromised land due to, to sea level rise. Um, we're seeing their freshwater resource impacts, less rain, less fresh water in a lot of the Pacific Islands in the Western Pacific, that uh, in Kiribati, for example, that's impacting a people's ability to access water that will help with both drinking and with growing food. So those are near-term events that are happening, and we're seeing some events happening here in the United States as well. Okay, now just going back to the Pacific sure. a bit. Yeah. Okay, uh, what you, you mentioned earlier, people have to deal with these things. What are they doing? What are they doing? And, and how many are we talking about? How, how many folks are we talking about? And the reason I ask this right. is because uh, it's very easy for us to put this out of our consciousness because it's people in some other little island somewhere. Right. And I'm going to get to where that leads us because I don't think it's a spectator sport. I think we're all involved from what I've read. But I'd like you to first tell us, what, what are they doing about it? How many are, are we involved just in those areas, in the Pacific yeah. areas? And I want to move on to our, our United States and Hawaii. Yeah, so uh, what, so the Carteret Islands are the perfect example of, of there being a, a sort of a recognition that the long-term viability of the islands is just is not there, and that in the short to medium term, they needed to find a place to relocate to. So this was a very active planned relocation in which you know decision makers came together, sought funding, sought a, a, a host community that they could move to, sought economic development in that new community because they're fish and taro people, and you can't do that where they're, where they're moving to in terms of high land. So there are these very specific examples of, of planned relocation. You have countries like Kiribati who, that have been really powerful voices in the international community about their plight with respect to uh, having a very um, a dire sort of prognosis in terms of long-term viability. It's, it's likely not going to be able to sustain many more generations of life there. Uh, and they are now in the uh, sort of pursuing an effort to migrate to other places uh, under a, a policy of migration with dignity. So training up their young folks to have skills that might be useful for communities that they would relocate to, whether in Australia or New Zealand or even here in the United States. Yeah. So like the song says, they have to start swimming. Or they'll sink like a stone, and it sounds like they've started to swim. Now we have to take a little bit of a break right here, and then we'll we'll come back and maybe talk a little bit more about where we're going in the United States. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ethan Allen, host of Likeable Science here on ThinkTechHawaii.com. I hope you'll join me every Friday at 2 p.m. to discover what's likable about science. Aloha, I'm Kirsten Baumgart-Turner, host of Sustainable Hawaii. Thanks for watching Think Tech this summer. We have a lot of terrific shows of great importance, and I hope you'll watch my show too every Tuesday at noon as we address sustainability issues for Hawaii. They're really pertinent as the World Conservation Congress approaches in September and the World Youth Congress that's focusing on sustainability next year as well. Have a great summer and tune in at noon every Tuesday. I'm Jay Fidel, and I'm the host of Research in Manoa, Mondays from 12 to 1 on thinktechhawaii.com. 
take a look at us and learn about uh, geophysics, learn about planetology, learn about the ocean and earth sciences at UH Manoa, you'll really enjoy it. So come around, we'll see you then. All right, well, we're back uh, with climate-induced migration is not a spectator sport. And uh, we haven't really got into why it's not a spectator sport yet, because we've just been watching islanders in the Carteret Islands uh, who have been turned into refugees by sea rise. And uh, I, I'd like to just ask, how, how many, approximately, how long have they lived there? in those islands and now they can't live there any longer and how many folks are we talking about? Well in this case we're talking about two, about 2,000 people that were moving. Um, they've been in the island for th hundreds of years. Uh, they're, you're talking about a, a community, a, a, a not an insignificant number that then needs to reintegrate into or integrate into another community and what's uh, important to understand is oftentimes these kinds of migrations are happening from sensitive places to other sensitive places. So there's a political aspect of this also. Uh, right, there's a climate and political aspect. So Papua New Guinea has a lot of uh, vulnerability and uh, impacts with, with respect to climate change that we're anticipating in terms of changes in precipitation and also impacted by sea level rise. But there's also civil conflict that has been in their recent history. Uh, and that's true of other countries in the Pacific, like Fiji, where you're seeing there you know, being both internal and cross-border migration that's going to happen. Okay, now we, we've talked about those other people, okay? Yeah. The other people in the Pacific Islands. What do things look like for Hawaii and the United States? I mean, how about Manhattan? It's, how about Honolulu? How about sure. Kailua? How do those, what is, what can you tell us about what the outlook is for home? Sure. Well, I'll start uh, sort of at the United, this, this sort of U.S. level. We, we know that there are at least 16 communities that are right now working through some plan of relocation. So, and that's in the state of Washington, that's in Louisiana, and that's in the state of Alaska. So we know that it's happening in, in the U.S. And that's, that's not even talking about places like Manhattan that have high population, but also high capital and resources in very flood prone and very uh, vulnerable um, locations like we saw after uh, Superstorm Sandy. So if we even set aside the sort of the, the impacts to our economy and major economies in our major cities, we're talking about communities that have to leave throughout our continental United States and Alaska. In Hawaii, what we're looking at is a number of very vulnerable resources at the coastline. We know that we have a lot of um, uh, very valuable locations, real estate and otherwise, at the coastline that is going to be impacted by sea level rise and already we're seeing some impacts of that. High priced uh, homes. Many high priced <laughs> homes. We do have high island, that we have parts of our island that would, would continue to sustain us so that while there are going to be other impacts like, again, freshwater uh, availability and, and heat, we know that in terms of sea level rise, if we plan appropriately, we could uh, fashion other communities that are not going to be as vulnerable to um, coastal inundation. But that's a massive management and political concern that we need to get, get ahead of. And that is uh, outside of the possible, uh, probable, I would say, um, immigration and migration of people from the other countries in the Pacific and elsewhere that might need to come here for uh, better prospects. Oh, there, there are two questions that you, you've, you've raised for me. One is, uh, 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 I guess, are we doing anything? Are we making any plans? We've talked about other states like Alaska, that they're, they're actually conscious of it and aware of it. Uh, we're out here in the Pacific and we see a, uh, uh, some islands that people have become refugees, we certainly don't want that to happen here. Are we doing anything about it? That's one question. Right. Second question is, you're now talking about refugees coming to Hawaii or to the United States. Well, okay, so I, I want to be very careful here because yeah. when we we're talking about refugees, um, there, you know, refugee, the term has a number of different right. definitions, right? So when we talk about it in sort of informal conversation, we understand that we're, we're you know, describing those that have been displaced. Um, 
likely under uh, dire circumstances, and, uh, and they may not have a home to go back to, at least one that's viable. Now, when we're talking about it in the legal context, that these are not refugees by the definition in the convention, right? Okay. For a couple of reasons. One is that most of the people that are moving as a result of climate impacts are moving and will move internally, so they will be within country. So we're, you know, we're not talking about those that are crossing borders that have some conflict or political conflict or urgent reason to, to run from persecution, for example. Okay. So absent that legal definition, that's where the law it needs to do a lot more work in terms of what the protections are for people that are displaced. Well, are there folks that, want, that are being displaced as yeah. climate refugees in, <laughs> in that sense that are saying, can we come to the United States or can we come to Hawaii? Or is that something that's a prospect? Uh, I would say it's, it's, it's probable we're seeing evidence that that may be one of the triggers that has have pushed communities and peoples. For example, we've seen some studies um, looking at the lack of arable land uh, uh, or decreased crop yields in Mexico, for example, encouraging cross-border migration in those cases. If you were to ask someone why they're moving, they're not going to say, well, I'm, it's, a cli it's climate change and we're seeing less rainfall, et cetera, et cetera. But if you were to sort of peel back the layers a bit when you see these cross-border migrations, then you can understand that viable livelihood are being compromised in places that are uh, vulnerable and then are sort of encouraging again and pushing people to move and this is uh, this is quite um, I, I think it's a it's one of those circumstances that are quite uh, uh, awful if you think about the inputs you know what 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 we're seeing and how we t tend to treat people that are migrating so I want to be very careful because it's not as much of a uh, a security concern, although it might be over time, it's more of a humanitarian concern. And when we think about people that might be coming to Hawaii, are we prepared to address what might be a humanitarian issue in terms of people that have had to leave because their livelihoods have been compromised by activities that were beyond their control, well, especially in the Pacific, where inputs to climate change have been And, and talking negligible. about political climate yeah. as opposed to the weather climate, sure. that's a whole new mix. It is now, a whole Especially mix. in the current Day. Yes. You know, I, I suppose uh, being an academic, you know, my hope is that more information helps, but I, I don't know that that's true. Storytelling also helps, right? So when we hear stories of people that are forced to move and you hear stories of, of uh, Native communities that have been relocated over time, over centuries, like we're seeing playing out on, uh, on the continental U.S., then to have to contemplate another relocation based on, again, something to which they've had very little input. It's, we're, we're seeing a series of, 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 I would argue, injustices that we need to be more proactive about addressing. Well, you know, I still want to get <laughs> to what we're doing about it sure. in here in Hawaii and what we're doing about it in the United States and, again, what we should be doing about it. But you, you reminded me uh, of... Uh, uh, a story by John Steinbeck, uh, who wrote a book called Grapes of Wrath about a drought in the United States, and it sounds very much the same type of idea. Uh, yes, although I would say, you know, we do have, and you asked earlier about how much we can link to climate change. These, a lot of these events have happened before. Right. A lot of novel, ocean acidification, the kind of sea level rise we might see, are not ex experiences sort of the physical world hasn't had that impact since we've been sort of had civilizations and had a dog in the fight, if you will. But you're, you know, we have seen um, droughts and the Dust Bowl phenomenon before, and then you're, you can tell the resilience of a community by its ability to bounce back from those things. Which they but, seem to have done. Which in that they have instance. done, sure. And the difference here is that climate change is sort of a continual, inexorable rise in change. It's sort of this notion of a new normal that you may hear a lot with respect to climate change, but in fact, we're not talking about a steady state. We're not moving from one to another steady state. We're actually seeing this sort of continued uh, and rate of change as well as a, the change itself. So the story of the Grapes of Wrath, it was a, about a drought and there was a lot of s social things going sure. on and political things going on at the same time and, and the land, however, seems to have gone back, but now I hear that, that we may not that there may be some chance that that's not going to be as easy <laughs> as it happened in the 30s and the 40s. Yes. Although that was a pretty tough time if, right. if, 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 to live. Uh, but so, so let, let's come back. What are we doing here in Hawaii? What are we doing in the United States? Is there hope? 
for us? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think we, you know, the, the, the more we sort of act on the information that we know and we work um, with all voices at the table in terms of making decisions about how to be more resilient and how we might deal with migration uh, under what we understand to be the case now, we'll, we'll be able to make better decisions. So I would say there's hope, but I think we're, we're, we're running out of time in terms of doing that on, uh, in a way that's not under duress, that's not reactive, if is, you will. Is there a plan in, the, in Hawaii? We, not for migration specifically. There's a lot happening with respect to climate. Okay, okay. But, well, uh, can you take both of those yeah. issues? So I would say right now with respect to migration, we're at a sort of um, investigative stage, right? We're trying to understand how much of the in-migration we're seeing from uh, other communities or movement of peoples in the Pacific, for example, is in any way attributable to climate impacts. And then using that information to try to project uh, future forecasts on that so we can better plan, right? Because most people want to know what's the risk? What are we risking here by acting or not acting? Um, in terms of climate, we have, you know, we have a number of things that are on the mitigation front, like our 100% renewable mandate with respect to electricity. Um, that's a massive uh, example of how we might reduce our emissions and be more resilient because for the most part, you know, fossil fuel reliance uh, does not allow for adaptation resilience as well in place. Solar panels, wind, wind farms, all of those sorts of things can make you more resilient. So it's a, it's a sort of, it has co-benefits. There's the fewer emissions, uh, more resilience with respect to, to energy. We also have, um, you know, working on adaptation frameworks that are uh, in our planning act. Um, we have a inter, um, departmental climate adaptation committee that's looking to streamline our responses to sea level rise that's that's being sort of headed out of dlnr there are efforts to make us more resilient okay i'd like you to just comment briefly to close this session on how we should approach climate r refugees what 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 should be our legal and our human responses and i think they're different <laughs> Perhaps. Yeah. Perhaps they shouldn't be, but. Yeah, I think um, we are, this is one of the challenges of climate change that needs better law and policy attention. Uh, and we need to be able to respond to the, uh, the, the risks that we're, we're facing. We're looking, the number of people globally who might move, we're looking at a number that may be around 200 million. The range is quite large, but we know that we have uh, um, the magnitude that requires response. What we see in the, in the, in the U.S. right now is, is that there are attempts to have coordinated responses that are happening through the Obama administration's efforts uh, that are really important to look at and support. There, this is a really big legal and policy challenge, challenge, but I do think that we as humans can understand the vulnerability of being forced from our homes. Many of us love where we live. So do so many others in the, in the world, especially our Pacific Island neighbors. And so being, um, having the compassion, interest, empathy for that will be, will be critical when we think about the issues. You know, you've raised a lot of uh, points here uh, about climate change and climate refugees, and uh, it really touches home, but I think we've, we've scratched the surface. We've scratched the surface on this, and we really appreciate you coming in to, to tell us about this. Thank you Pleasure. very much. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it.